Sabbath. It's a blessing to be here today. I uh, will tell you just a little bit about my wife and son and I, and then we will move into our, our message today. But um, I'd like to say a special thanks to Sharon for the invitation. When you go on vacation, one of the first questions you ask when it's over a weekend is, what are we going to do on Sabbath? And um, you made it easy. We had an answer right away. We didn't even have to look for where the church was going to be. I'd um, also like to thank Pastor Ricky for um, sharing your, your pulpit and your congregation with us. It's a blessing to be able to be here today. Um, I am a, a Ohio boy from the Midwest. Uh, grew up in Northwest Ohio on a, a dairy farm. And my dad also raised uh, corn and soybeans. And uh, so I, I have that in my background. Um, I, have, I have lots of tractor memories and uh, cow stories. And I won't go into all of those today, but we could talk farm stuff for hours. Um, I went to uh, Great Lakes Adventist Academy where I um, met Deborah. It was her first year there, and it was my first year there, which means I didn't know it was your first year because I was a freshman. I was uh, three hours from home, and it was a brand new experience, but um, yeah, I remember you were teaching witnessing um, at least for the first couple of years that I was there, and uh, I don't know if it was a Tuesday night or Thursday night, we'd go over to the church, and you probably remember what night of the week it is. I don't know. But Tuesday night, I, I had a 50-50 chance with Tuesday and Thursday. And um, I had an opportunity with a friend of mine to go into the community every Tuesday night and, and uh, give a Bible study to um, a, a lady, and it was a, an experience at a young age that was one of the many formative experiences that were a blessing to me. Um, from uh, Great Lakes, I went to Southern to study theology to become a pastor. And uh, I met my wife, Lorella, there. She was walking from the church uh, on her way back to the dorm. And the heavens opened and a shaft of light came down and illuminated her. And I heard this voice that said, she is the one. <laughs> if you want to know the true version of the story, you can talk to her later. But that's my <laughs> version of the story. After um, we met, we dated for about three years. Um, my wife was born to missionary parents on the island of Guam. And so we say she's a Guamanian, and I take her up to Wisconsin, where we're currently living, and I joke that occasionally in the dead of winter, when it's negative 7,000 degrees, she's curled up in a ball under the bed, rocking back and forth, begging for mercy. <laughs> um, she's uh, come out, and we've, we've had the sun this week, and been on the beach, and she's opened up like a flower, and I've realized that I need to get more beach time for my wife to help. Uh, um, we you guys all in agreement with all right, we're moving, Lorella. When we get home, we'll pack up. <laughs> uh, my son Joshua is a freshman at Wisconsin Academy, and uh, I work at the conference office, and we're about a mile and a half from the academy, so uh, we don't have a very far drive to go to get him to school, or, or to go to work for that matter. I pastored um, for quite a number of years, and my last district um, 15 years was in Wisconsin, and then I took a district in um, Salt Lake City, Utah, and I was there for three years, and my conference president in Wisconsin, uh, the, the joke is he called me up and said, Adam, stop wandering in the wilderness and come home, and I'm back in Wisconsin serving as the ministerial director. And for those of you that don't know what that means, I, I think the easiest way to describe it is my job is to support our pastors. Uh, the Wisconsin Conference is a much smaller conference than what you have here in Florida. My entire pastoral team that I provide support for is uh, 35 pastors. And um, I think that's what you have in this neighborhood. I'm not sure exactly. Maybe it's not quite that concentrated. Uh, we have 90 churches in the state of Wisconsin. And so I, I go back and forth between thinking I don't have any churches to pastor or I'm pastoring 90. I, I'm not sure which of those two it is. But it's a, a blessing to be here. See if I can trigger my computer one more time to see. Oh, there it goes. Up here. All right. And I'll go with that. Um, it is a, a thrill to be back in Florida. Both sets of my grandparents, while they were, were still living, had homes here. I had a, a grandparents that lived in Avon Park and some other grandparents that lived in Inverness. And so we would come down here just about every year somewhere in Florida to visit. And uh, the last few years, we, we haven't 
been able to come as much. Um, my, my wife and son don't have the same memories I do, but I remember those vacations where you crammed everything in the car and drove for three weeks to get to Florida. Um, stop at the border, you get the free orange juice. And do you know that the free orange juice is now down to a little thimble that they give you? It's a, I think it's a quarter of an ounce. But I wanted to go for seconds, but I didn't want to feel greedy, so I just uh, took the, the cup that I had. I talked a little bit about my past. We each have a past. We each have a story. We each have a history. There's a, a path that God has brought us on. And it's sometimes nice to think about our past. Sometimes there's bumps in the roads that we would rather forget. But I think in the middle of the night when we wake up and it's quiet and dark out, a lot of us will sometimes let our thoughts turn to not the past, but the future. What does the future hold? What's next? And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today. I liked our Sabbath school this morning dealing with faith, and the passage we're going to look at today, I believe, is a passage that's really steeped in faith building. And so that's what we'll focus on. Let's bow our heads for another word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship here today. I thank you for the kind welcome that we have received, and it's a blessing, Lord, to know that wherever we go on Sabbath morning, that there are bodies of believers around the world that are worshiping you, lifting up voices in song and in studying the Bible. Thank you that we can be in a church family that is family, even if we've met for the first time. I ask that you would direct our hearts and minds to you, uh, your spirit that, that uh, gave wisdom for the scriptures to be written. I ask that you would send your spirit to give us understanding today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll digress slightly. I had an opportunity to go to Ghana, Africa uh, many years ago now, and I sat down in the in the um, congregation on Sabbath morning. I was scheduled to preach there. I was doing an evangelistic series, but not a lot of people spoke English. And so I'm in Sabbath school, and I don't understand what's going on, but somebody comes up and hands me a Sabbath school quarterly. And I look down, and it put a smile on my face, because even though it wasn't in English, it was the same pictures as the Sabbath school quarterly that I was studying at home. And that was the first time in my life, it's been over 20 years ago now, but the first time in my life when I realized we are a worldwide church. Amen. And all around the globe, we are gathering together on Sabbath morning. Now, our songs might be a little different. Our sermon topics might vary from church to church. But most places are studying the same Sabbath school lesson. And that was a really cool thing to think about. It's not just what we're doing here this morning, but we're doing this around the world. Amen. That's a blessing. Amen. I titled today's sermon, God Knows. And I think that that phrase can be interpreted a lot of ways, but I think it's important for us to remember that no matter what happens, God knows. There's not anything that surprises God, that, that shocks God off the throne, so to speak. I think a lot of us, as we sit here, we might be thinking about the future, talking about the future, wondering about the future, and for a lot of us, the future can look uncomfortable. I have zero desire to dip my, my toes into politics this morning, and I'm not going to do it. And I also don't know a lot about the environment as far as COVID goes. Um, there's a lot of COVID jokes from state to state, but each state has handled things a little bit different. But I will say that COVID has run the gamut between being extremely challenging to some people to, on the other end of the spectrum, just being an inconvenience to other people. And I would say that those of you sitting here today, you fit somewhere in that spectrum. I have some church members in Wisconsin that lost loved ones to, to COVID, and they would be on this side. I will say for myself and my immediate family, COVID was probably more of an inconvenience for us. But I feel for my friends that have lost people. And we, we think about all of the things that have taken place over this last year. Um, in, in the realm of politics, you were, were, you were in dangerous ground if you were willing to say who you voted for. And if you voted for this person, you were with the devil. And if you voted for that person, you were probably with the devil. And you kind of go, wow, this is not a safe climate. This is dangerous ground. Um, 
there's been a lot of issues in race relations that have been talked about. Uh, we live 30 minutes, 32, 35 minutes away from downtown Madison, which is the capital of Wisconsin. And we were very safe where we were at, but we took a drive in the middle of the day during some of the riots that were taking place. And all around the capital, everything was boarded up. And uh, once it's boarded up, apparently that was an invitation for graffiti. And we didn't have any with us, so we didn't get to add to it. <laughs> we wouldn't have any. We're not artistic that way. But it was amazing how things could go from being calm and peaceful to being violent with the snap of your fingers, it felt like. And I could go on and on and on with all of these things. And I'll, I'll be a little transparent about myself. When COVID first shut everything down, and I believe your church was with just about everybody else, where you didn't meet for a little while, where nobody was home, and you start to ask yourself questions. What happens if we don't need to go back to work? And as a, a denominational employee, I started wondering, what happens to the church if we can't come back into our sanctuaries? Community is such a huge part of what God uses us of, of the way God uses us to spread the gospel, what better plan than to tell us we can't get together in a community if you're safe? Now, I'm not suggesting that it is or isn't a good idea that we take healthy or choices for our health, but the longer that we have people around the country, maybe around the world, who can't meet together, what a, what a great ploy if you want to stop the gospel from being spread. And I started to think... Um, I, I, I believe that God has worked through for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to the very last moment of history. Amen. But I don't know that it's necessarily going to look like it does now. And so I started asking questions, what if our churches can't ever meet again? How do we form back together in groups and still continue forward in our mission? And then you have to start asking some hard questions. Your questions would have been different. But mine was, how can I do what God has called me to do if I don't get a paycheck anymore? Because I still feel the call to do what God has called me to do. I will say at this particular point in history, I'm thankful that I haven't had to answer that question. But I think that's a question that um, I need to continue to work on for myself. And I think each one of us need to figure out how can we move forward with what God has called us to do when things don't look the way we expect them to look. When things are not as comfortable as we're used to them being. And um, probably to say the future looks uncomfortable is, is saying it in a pretty weak way. It might look a lot worse than just uncomfortable. I put a couple things in my presentation here. Uh, when times are hard, it can seem hard to pray. But when times are hard, it's when we need to pray the most. And I find it ironic. Um, and I've even had these thoughts myself where we say, man, things are so tough. I just, I just can't concentrate. I, I can't pray. I'm thankful that God, the Holy Spirit, can pray on our behalf. But when things get really tough, that's when we need to focus on God that much more. Mm -hmm. When we have doubts, I think that often drives us to look towards the devil. And that's not where we should be looking. When we have concerns, we need to look to Christ. It's so easy for us to lose our focus. Now, we may not consciously say, I'm looking at the devil. But we can let doubts and worries and fears and concerns cloud our vision from Jesus, and we're focused on the things that Satan finds important and not us. And it's with this I want to transition into looking at Christ, being focused on Jesus, and we do that by looking in Scripture. And I'm going to guess, even though I don't know most of you, that most of you are, are Seventh-day Adventists, there may be some here that are not. And most of you have probably spent a lot of time in church. We're going to look at a passage today that may be new for some of you, but will probably be one a lot of you have read before. And when you have read a passage before, you know how it ends. And when you know how it ends, it takes the suspense away a little bit. It's like getting a, a book that somebody says, this is a great book, and you say, I've, I've already read it. But I would like to challenge you to try to go through this story with me today and try and think about it again for the first time. And you'll have to be conscious to do that because as soon as I tell you where we're going, many of you are going to say, I know this story. But I want you to focus as we go through it, remembering that the people in this story didn't know how this story was going to end. 
And I think when we think about it that way, it adds a little bit extra meaning to it. Our focus this morning is going to be in Daniel chapter 2. And parts of what I'm going to share are probably going to be very familiar. Um, I'm not going to take the exact same um, tack that we would in a public evangelistic series. Um, our purpose this morning is a little bit different. But we're going to go through Daniel chapter 2. It's new. It's, I mean, it's time to have closing prayer now. No, okay, I just wanted to check. No, no, it's only 11. Oh, it's only 11. Oh, it is 11. You're right, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure saying in Wisconsin where I'm from, because it is 11 in Wisconsin. <laughs> Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. Now, in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Dreams are funny things. I woke up the other day with a strange dream, and I don't even remember what it, what it was when I was telling my wife, but there are a couple of dreams in my life that have stuck out in my mind just because of the absurdity of them. One was a dream I actually had at Great Lakes Academy, and I, I think my son has heard this story before. But it's one of those dreams where just things that don't make sense happen. But I, I woke up one morning in my dream, and I, I started to, to swim out of my bed um, down the hallway in the dormitory at, at Great Lakes Adventist Academy. Now, you already can tell you're in a dream here, because you don't swim through air. And I don't know all the things that happened in this dream, but I ended up in the parking lot out back where my car was parked, and I went and I picked up my car and held it over my head. Dreams don't make sense, and there's not a, a point to the end of this, other than dreams don't make sense. But I'm holding my car over my head, and then the entire car stays in the shape of a car, but turns to uncooked white rice. <laughs> and I throw this car, again, doesn't make sense, and the car lands in the driveway and the rice just goes everywhere. And you wake up and you go, what was that? And I'm not about to try and come up with a spiritual explanation for that. It was just a weird dream. King Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, chapter 2, verse 1, and he had a dream, and it bugs him. What was that dream? Why did I have this dream? What is this dream about? Was the rice involved? No, no, I don't think that's what he thought. But King Nebuchadnezzar is there. It says he was so troubled his sleep left him. He couldn't go back to sleep. And so a king does what a king can do. I would get in big trouble if I tried to wake everybody up in the house to do this. But the king can do this. In verse 2, the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they stood, so they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Everything's okay so far. Maybe this exact thing hasn't happened before, but they're not unused to being summoned by the king. They gather together, they come to the king, all of these supposed wise men. I think at the Pathfinder camp where they call them the wise guys, but we'll, we'll stay with wise men. All of these these leaders that were supposed to be smart. And the king says, I want you guys to tell me my dream. And I'm sure that they didn't think much of that phrase yet. The king's sleepy. He wants to know what his dream means. And so in verse 4, the, the Chaldeans asked for some clarity. <clears throat> then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. This might have been a sleepy, O king, live forever. I'm not sure. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. So they're looking for a little clarity here, because they want to know what it is the king exactly wants. The king can't really mean that he wants to, them to tell him what the dream was. He's got to be asking for the interpretation. Verse 5, the king clarifies, and his clarification is not what they wanted to hear. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, and maybe with a little bit of a frustration in his voice, My decision is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. I think the king is here saying, stop messing around, guys. I'm serious. I want to know what the dream is. All of a sudden, if I'm one of the wise guys, one of the wise men, I'm a little concerned. 
I can make up an interpretation. But if I tell the king what his dream is, he's going to know if I'm right or wrong. At least that's a natural thing to think. How am I going to bluff my way out of this one? Whew. Verse 7. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream. Please, let us, please tell us the dream, and we'll give the interpretation. Stalling a little bit there. Verse 8. The king answered, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. So I think the king's got multiple things going on here. First, he's frustrated and wants to know his dream, and second, he's starting to think, Maybe these guys have tricked me all this time. I wonder if they can really do all this stuff they've claimed to do. And so now the king is its almost adding insult to injury. But the king doubles down. He doesn't say, no, I'm going to tell you the dream. He says, tell me the dream or else. And this or else carries a lot of weight with it. Verse 10. The Chaldeans have a moment here of very honest transparency that they probably wished they didn't have to say. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. Who wants to be the one to tell the king he's asking something that's unreasonable? I'm not sure that's where I want to be. I'm not sure I want to be the one to tell the king that. Verse 11, it is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, lowercase g, whose dwelling is not with flesh. And they were super close. I would say an uppercase g, except for God, who can t answer this question. But they're basically saying, king, this is not something a human can do. And they were right. A human could not do this. Verse 12, this is where things really, really get ramped up. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men. Now, this doesn't say like the uh, Bible story books that I was raised with that are really good books. This doesn't say they're about to be killed. The Bible, the New King James that I'm reading from, says they began killing the wise men. People are dying. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now this is where I go to, many of us know how this story ends. At this point in the story, Daniel does not know how this story ends. Daniel finds out the king is angry and a decree has gone out to kill a group of people of which he is a part of. There's some suspense here. Daniel doesn't even know why he's about to be killed. He just knows that a death decree has gone out. Daniel tries to figure this out in verse 14. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? I think I would ask that of anybody who wanted to kill me. Why is this decision so urgent? Why don't we just slow down here a little bit? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. We, we get the picture in Daniel's chapter 1 and 2 that Arioch and Daniel had a friendly relationship. And Arioch is willing to slow down and say, this is why the king wants you dead. This is what's going on. And in verse 16, um, or, yeah, made the decision known to Daniel, verse 15. Verse 16, so Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Now I find verse 16 specific, uh, uh, very interesting because Daniel asks for what? He asks for time. What did the other wise men ask for? They asked for time. They said, give us time. Apparently the king was in one of two places. I think both are plausible, maybe both were the right answer. One is, it appears that he had a relationship with Daniel that maybe had an extra level of trust. 
That seems very possible, especially if you read the end of chapter 1. The other possibility, and, and both can be true, is the king realized he was just about to kill everybody that was supposed to be able to answer this question. And maybe if somebody else was stepping forward, maybe he needed to slow down just a little bit and make sure that he didn't cut off the last opportunity to find out what his dream was. Possibly both are true. Maybe there's a third answer. But either way, Daniel goes in and asks for time. And in verse 17 it says, Then Daniel, oh, apparently he gets the answer, yes. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I want to come to verse 19 in a moment, but picture this. I don't know if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, stayed in the same room with Daniel, if they were close to each other, but a guard comes and tells Daniel, I'm here to kill you. Daniel says, whoa, 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 why? And he says, well, this has happened. The king had a dream. Nobody can tell him what the dream was. Daniel says, take me to the king. And so he's whisked off to the king, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are back in the house wondering what's going on. Is Daniel even going to come back alive? Daniel does come back, and I am sure they're right up there saying, okay, what happened? Oh, the king has given us some time. Tomorrow morning, we've got to tell the king what he dreamed. We what? Again, if you know the end of the story, we don't think through this a little bit. But put yourself in the position of one of those four Hebrew young men. We have to do what? And what did they do? It says they immediately go to prayer. Amen. They focus on God because they knew that they could not do this themselves. And it's interesting. They list an honest motivation here. They don't say that they do this for the betterment of the world or to give the king the answer that he's looking for. They say in verse 18 that they seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest. Do you hear that? Their motive is to survive. Right here in verse 18, they're praying to God, help us to be able to answer the king because we don't want to die. That's pretty, pretty honest, isn't it? That's pretty raw. Verse 19, And the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And verse 19, I wish was bigger. Because something that's this massive, how can you just say, so God told them the dream, and they thank God? That's huge. We don't know when it happened. Did they pray for, for eight hours and they had to see the king at 7 a.m. and at 6.59 God revealed the dream? Did they kneel down and pray and after 15 minutes God said, this is what it is, have a good sleep, gentlemen. The Bible doesn't tell us. But they worked with God and they prayed, asking for God to give them um, an answer. And verse 19 says, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. For time's sake, I was tempted to skip this prayer, but I think it's actually more important to say this prayer because this prayer is an acknowledgement that God came through for them. And I'm going to read that in verses 20 to 23. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what it is in the darkness, and light dwells in him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made, us, have made known to us the king's demand. Daniel doesn't receive the dream, and then wait to go and see what the experience with the king is going to be like. When he gets the answer from God, he thanks God immediately. Before he does anything else, thank you, Lord. And I think this prayer is, a, a, is an honest, impressive prayer just because of its, its um, humanness. Lord, thank you for revealing your will to me.
verse 24. Daniel seeks an audience with King Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said this to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. It says Arioch in verse 25 does this quickly, but I think Arioch might have been just a little concerned.